All right, so yeah. Um, so let me put your code back the way it was for the recording. So the special casing it like this doesn't really help very much because handling a mostly horizontal line, you only need one case for it, you know? So rather than handling go to the right, go to the left, and you know, maybe the algebra breaks one way or the other because you get negatives or something, um, I would just um, delete all those lines down there and uh, just swap swap the, the starting and ending point, right? The, the big thing is, um, you don't need that anymore. But the big thing, actually, let's put it back, uh, is you need to check, add, check to see if the line is more vertical or horizontal. And if the line is more vertical, then you loop across the Ys. Because if you don't, you're going to get a gap, right? If the line is mostly horizontal, then iterating each pixel horizontally is good, and you'll end up with a solid, unbroken line. If the thing's mostly vertical, then as you loop horizontally, you get like one dot, one dot, and then the end, and it is yeah. broken. And so you need I to... I, I did handle that, though, with the... Uh, let's see what point it is. It's kind of like in the middle of it. Like if... Uh, okay, okay. Next Y and all that. Yeah, so that's why you're getting that weird uh, output. Okay. Yeah, all right. So uh, 20, 20... Zero, zero. That's why you're getting that weird output like that, mm. because uh, you have a for loop inside of your for loop. These, this, this for loop here uh, should be an alternative to this one. So you're both looping over every pixel horizontally, and you're looping over every pixel vertically mm. <laughs> when it's a mostly vertical line. And so those two, those need to be in an if statement. So if uh. if it's more vertical loop across the y's if it's more horizontal loop across the x's so this guy should be option one and this guy should be option two okay uh, okay and you don't need um maybe you don't need this as well because of the uh the swappage you might need to swap them if the If it, yeah, you always want to swap it so that y1 is the smaller value if you're if it's more vertical. So yeah, before we do this, let's add a check to see if the line's more vertical or horizontal. All right, so yeah, vertical would be like the absolute value of x1 minus x2. This is why we like using signed integers instead of unsigned integers. This breaks dramatically if you use unsigned. And that's that's the problem um, ship with a fixed that your unsigned fixed point. Is because if you anytime you do a subtraction, you have to be damn sure that <laughs> the the first number is bigger than the second number, or or equal, or everything explodes. Right. Um, so vertical, horizontal. Uh, I, I I don't like working with unsigned integers except as an optimization thing. I, I like unsigned integers just so that you can uh, avoid a, a check against less than zero. That's really the only benefit to using an unsigned integer. Even if your type is like um, a value that can't be less than zero, I would still not use an unsigned integer because oftentimes you difference them. You want to find out who's further away. You know, uh, is y one further away or you know, y two or or whatever? Um, and if you subtract them, then uh, you underflow and, and you get an accent. In fact, one of the programming assignments I'm going to give you this semester has that bug in it. The bug is actually caused by me using unsigned integers for the coordinate system because you can't have a negative coordinate. But because they're all unsigned, uh, when you do a subtraction like this, um, you know, if uh, x2 is bigger than x1, you end up getting like two, 4 billion, right? <laughs> Which is wrong, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that, that bug's coming up. And uh, I left it in there because it was a bug that got me. Because I, because I was just thinking to myself, like, oh, okay, the coordinates have to be between zero and hundred. I'll just use an unsigned, uh, an unsigned char, you know, to hold the the coordinate system. Because, um, like, if it was signed, then it'd be getting pretty close to that boundary, you know, like one hundred twenty-seven or whatever is the max on a char, and a hundred's pretty close to that. So I'm like, oh, I'll make it unsigned, you know, so I don't, you know, in case I need to add. Yeah, that that was that was a uh, that was an annoying bug to track down because the the algorithm worked mostly but like it didn't in left and up like it worked 
correctly when you're going down into the right, but the left and the up, everything exploded because of subtracting a bigger value from a smaller value. It would underflow up to max integer or whatever the type size was, 255, I guess. And, uh, and then all the things just exploded. Just like the Vajant Dam. I don't know what the Vajant Dam is. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Brutal. Okay. Yeah, good to know. All right. Um, why is my brightness so high? Turn that down. Yeah. Uh, in LA, they had a dam failure too that killed a lot of people back in the day, 20s or 30s, small whole end. It's responsible for that. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically you do that and then you just check to see let's put this inside of here. And rather than that, we want to say if vertical is less than or equal to horizontal. And then down here. Basically, same idea as this code here, but um, make it start at, uh, you know, do a swap to, and just start at y1 going up to y2, and then you just have to do the algebra to make this stuff work correctly. So I'll give you till Monday to, to get that done, Collins. Um, when your dads live through the Owens Dam collapse, oof. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Maholhand uh, considered it like the worst mistake of his life, I think. See if that's if that's the one I was thinking about. So like up in the grapevine or something. Uh, yeah, I'll we'll end. Hmm. Yeah, it's in the grapevine. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to talk about our next topic, and our next topic is triangle rasterization. So, um, I hope you can see that uh, these rasterization algorithms are not too big, they're not too bad, but they're also kind of annoying, <laughs> right? Like, like it's just algebra, right? Like it's not calculus, it's not, you know. It's not advanced mathematics. It's not even really trig. I mean, although today we're technically working with triangles, so that makes it trig, right? I don't know. Uh, what were you gonna say, Collins? <laughs> uh nothing. Just the uh, points are all over a bit of the header. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so at the end of the day, given a line, yeah, it's upside down. Um, given a line, you know, you have to find all the pixels in between. That's it. That's rasterization for a line. Now for triangles, uh, it's more of the same, right? So if you have three points on a triangle, it doesn't matter where they are, then uh, you know you can do a wireframe triangle pretty easily once your code works. Uh, <laughs> you can draw a triangle on the screen by simply doing the Bresenham or Wu's algorithm between the three points, right? That's called wireframe. And that's still an option in um, most game engines, at least, for debugging purposes. Like, so that you can turn off the texturing and the coloring and things like that. You can switch your game uh, rendering into wireframe, and it only draws the edges of the triangle. Does that make sense, Collins? Mm -hmm. 
And the algorithm is real easy. You just draw that line and that line and that line. So once you have a line renderer in, then line rendering a, uh, a, a triangle is easy. You just, there's three lines, do it. <laughs> you know? And uh, if you have a mesh, then um, you don't duplicate this one. Does that make sense? You've already drawn it. You don't need to draw it again. You know what I mean? So um, you, that's one of the reasons why you store your your things in meshes, so that any shared um, any shared uh, you know edge doesn't have to get re reprocessed. Okay, so I don't think we need to go into more detail on line in a wireframe, right? Like it's pretty obvious, yeah. Like yeah. Okay. So what, what's the interesting question is how do you fill a triangle, right? So um, uh, let's say we're just going to fill the triangle with just a color, like red, right? How do we, we got point 0.1, we got point 0.2, we got point 0.3 here. How do we fill all the pixels in the screen here? So, hmm, okay. <laughs> That's that's a little harder to think about, right? Like, hmm, how would I do it? Well, one way I've done it before, just because I was lazy, um, is I iterated over every pixel on the screen. <laughs> it's really easy to code. You just iterate over every pixel on the screen, and you check to see if a point is inside of the triangle. This is a horribly inefficient algorithm, by the way. Uh, but, you know, it's very easy to code. Um, and so how do you tell if a point is inside of a triangle? Well, assuming the triangle is held clockwise, and it doesn't have to be, it could be held counterclockwise, depending on the uh, library you're using. Um, that, that, what does that mean, ship? Um, so how do we tell if this point here, uh, we need a name for this point. Give me a name, Collins. I need a name. Point one. I already got a point one, man. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> I can't call it point one again. Point zero? No, it's not part of the triangle. Yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 in, it's incredibly inefficient. Yeah, but it's super easy, right? Uh, what was that? Uh, F. F. Yeah. A point named F. Okay, we'll go. We'll go with it. We'll go with it. All right. So yeah, you iterate over the entire screen, and then uh, this, you have a vector from. P1 to F and a vector from P1 to P2, and you cross product it, right? So you take the vector from P1 to P2 and the vector from uh, P1 to F, actually it's probably the other way around, whatever, and you cross product them. And then you see if the number you get is less than zero or greater than zero. You just, depending on which way you do the arrows, uh, you'll get a number that's positive if it's to the left and it's negative if it's to the right. But if you do the subtraction the other way, it's probably the other way around. So whichever, right? Uh, yeah, and that and that's that's about what I was about to say, Isaac. The the slightly more improved version of that horrible algorithm is you find the max and the min of the x and the y of this, and then you just iterate over every point in the rectangle, and you're still wasting half. You know, it's half as efficient as it should be. <clears throat> but it's easy to code, right? Because once you have a uh, once you have a cross product, which is one line of code, it's a one line function, uh, you pass the cross product, this point, this point, and this point, and the cross product tells you, is this point to the right of this one or not? True or false? Is it to the right? If it is, then you do the same for P2 to P3 and P2 to F. And if that one's to the right, cool, do it again. P1 to P3, P3 to F. If that one's to the right, cool, it's inside the triangle. You're done, it's three cross products, and uh, you can literally fill, you, you just do a rectangle and half the spots are gonna be outside, half are gonna be inside, approximately, and then you just fill the, fill the triangle that way. It's a very easy to write program. It's not efficient, but it's easy to write. It has that benefit. So, yeah, and, and you're not doing the whole screen. If you got a 4K monitor, you don't wanna run across the entire screen if, uh, uh, if you have like a little tiny triangle on the screen, right? So that's, uh, that's the, uh, I don't even know if there's a name for that, but like, there's like, uh, okay, so, so, so wireframe 
triangle is one way of filling a triangle by not filling it. Uh, second way is kind of like a cross product fill. Advantage, easy to write. Disadvantage, uh, it's inefficient. And if you're making a game engine, you don't want to, you don't want to use it. But for a little homework assignment or something like that, like I would notice, you know, even if you iterated over the whole screen, if you're drawing one triangle on the screen, like, you know, who cares? So, what's the better algorithm? Well, what you do is you, uh, so you do this. So you got a triangle. Point one, point two, point three, and we'll just assume it's oriented this way for simplicity. Okay, uh, and th this is perfectly horizontal. We're taking the simplest triangle possible. Okay, P one to P three is exactly horizontal. P two is above it, and somewhere between P one and P three, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. All right. So what we can do is we can start at P one, and we can do a line, a line raster over this way, right? So we can draw, like, let's say we're filling this thing with red. We do that. Then we go up one column. And you've got the line equation here, right? Like y is equal to mx plus b, right? And so you can find out you move, you know, one y up. So x. If y is equal to mx plus b, then x is equal to y minus b over m, right? And so you go up one y, and you find the starting x location here. You go up one y on this equation, whichever one that is. So you get an x1 and an x2, and then you just line fill that way. That makes sense? You go up one more y, and you fill those pixels in. You go up one more y, you fill all those pixels in. You go up one more y, you fill all those pixels in. It's technically pixels, right? Not a, not a, not a solid line. You go up one more y, you fill all those pixels in. Right. Make sense? Yeah. So you uh, just use the, you know, seventh grade math, you know, line equation, right? And you do the line, you do the, you find the x solution for each y. You start at y equals zero, essentially, assuming you've normalized this down to zero, zero. Y starts off at zero, so x is going to be at zero. And then for this one, it'll be some value, you know, and then every time you step up one Y, the X moves over to the right a little bit. Step up one Y, the X2 goes left a little bit. And then you just do a for loop. You say for, you know, and X equals X1. X is less than or equal to X2. X plus plus. Draw pixel. Um, X, Y, 255, 255. Actually, we're doing red, right? R, G, B. There we go. Okay. So it's going to draw a pixel at uh, here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here. And then you go up one Y. So you say 4 and Y equals Y1. Uh, y is less than or equal to y2. That's an x, not a y. Y is less than or equal to y2. Y plus plus. So here is y1, here is y2. Okay. And so that's it. That's how you, that's it. That's the equation to rasterize and fill a triangle. Now there's some obvious questions that you should be asking. Are we done? I, I argue we're actually done. It doesn't seem like this is going to handle a lot of cases though, right? Mm -hmm. What's what's the obvious question? Uh, I was thinking like if it jumped, sort of like our, our, well, our lines earlier. If it jumped? Like if it would, yeah, cause it, how it would just sort of, like, it, it would go across like the X, but it wouldn't complete like the whole line, sort of, it would just... 
Oh, but we're we're, iter- we're iterating across every x and every y. So there, there won't there won't be any gaps because uh, the the outer loop here starts at y one. Y one is this row. Y two is this row, and uh, and it is going at every row. It computes the starting and the ending x, and then iterates across every pixel uh, from x one to x two. Then it goes up a row. So it, it's a completely solid fill. It won't won't have any gaps in it. <clears throat> what if the left side was vertical? Okay. Uh, y one is here. Y two would be up here. Uh, let's draw the point up here. Um, I think it'd be fine. All right? If you had a line this way, you could use the line equation because at no point does it compute the slope really. Um, I mean, I guess it does here. Let's see. Uh, if it's vertical, then you just keep uh, you just keep x equal to x one the whole time. All right. So, yeah. Uh, if it was like here, yeah, it, it would still work because you're going up one row each time. There's there's not going to be any gaps because uh, you're you're iterating across every every row. At every row, you compute the starting and the ending x location using the powers of geometry, making careful that if you have a vertical line, you just keep the x the same as the one before, right? And uh, you just, then you loop across the row and draw every pixel in. It's very similar to drawing a rectangle, right? Like if you were drawing a rectangle, you would have a x1, y1, and an x2, y2, and you'd say for every row, right? For every row, for every column, draw a pixel at that location, right? very very similar except here uh, there's gonna be some code in between the code to do the math is like right here the math to s- figure out the starting part of the row and the ending part of the row that math is gonna be right there whereas on a rectangle they're fixed on a rectangle it's the same as you go up uh, with a triangle, they are going to probably come together as you go um, up. Yep. Could you split the rectangle in triangles? You could, but there's no benefit to it. Because the, the, the equation to render, to raster a uh, AABB is very easy. Starting, at, you know, for every row, start at min x, go to max x. Done. Right, but this, this code... Could use yeah I mean this is identical code for rasterizing a rectangle except x1 and x2 just don't change right they would just be like five and ten right or whatever yeah. there you wouldn't have to redo the math every time but it's it's almost identical to the code to raster correct so but no there's there's an obvious problem with this. Give me a triangle this won't work for. I mean, I, I guess I guess an, an obvious answer would, would be like this triangle, right? But I mean, that's pretty easy to fix. You just um, have that, but you know, you just swap y2 and y1, right? So. Uh, that's the starting row and then as you go up you just do the you know as you go up you just do the uh, you know you, you find you compute the uh, intercepts or whatever they're called you know and you just raster across so that's actually not a big deal um, now there, there is there is one one triangle that this won't work for it upside down actually is easy because you know you just swap it's like what we did earlier you just swap the y1 and the y2 and call it a day um, the, the the figuring out the intercepts is the same, so it literally doesn't change. It just switch the minute the min and the max y. Now a triangle it won't work for is this. If it looks like that. Okay. Because um, it's really two different triangles. And so what you do is you just split it and you rasterize the top half, you rasterize the bottom half separately. That's it. Um, because if you if you started here, right, you've got one line equation and one line equation and if you you know what i mean like if you tried going up you actually have to switch which which line equation you're using when you hit this point here and so the easiest way of of handling a, a triangle like that is you just split the triangle along the uh the midpoint there so if 
if it's not perfectly flat on the bottom there, you just rasterize the top half and you rasterize the bottom half using the very slightly but almost identical algorithm. And then you're done. That's it. Yeah, if you you can't really swap the points, right? Because like because there's actually two different there's actually two different lines, right? You've got this line here, and you've got you've got this line here. And so as you go up, you have to know when to switch from using this line to this line. And you can do that by computing like y midpoint or something like that if you want. If you want to do it all in one in one go, then you start at you start at min x y one, go up to max x uh, min y sorry y one, go up to max y y two. And as you're going up, you're computing the intercepts, right? Rasterizing across, rasterizing across, rasterizing across, like that. And whenever you hit the midpoint, you switch equations, and then you use this equation to compute the midpoints, or the intercepts, or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. That's it. So, um, would it be cache inefficient? Yeah, that's that's why it's usually easier to just split the split the triangles. So you just say, all right, here's one triangle, you rasterize it. All right, here's one triangle, you rasterize it. Then you don't need if statements within the code. Right. Yeah. Collins, does that make sense? Yeah. Think you could code it? <clears throat> I could try. All right, let's see what we got on the server here. <clears throat> So there's wireframe. <clears throat> right. um, yeah. Okay. So we're we're just gonna. Um, <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> uh, I think I think for Monday I'm just gonna have you do a solid fill. Okay. So this is this is just a solid fill. Um, Right, every pixel coming out is red. Right, it's just gonna go red. Right, Collins. Yeah. And so, what if you want it to not be a solid color? What if you wanted to? Uh, have like three different colors on the points and uh, um, and you wanted to interpolate the colors between them. That'd be pretty cool, right? Yeah. What is the name? I can show you what it looks like. Um, one second. I've made a lot of homeworks over the years. I really need to sort them in class. I think that's something I want to work on this summer. Putting these things into directories. Uh, man, I've made a lot of homework assignments over the years. 3D animation. Okay, so here you have, and it's flickering, but whatever. So I've got a triangle here that's got a red vertex, a green vertex, and a blue vertex. And so what's happening is I'm animating them and rotating them, and I'm filling them. And so this one has three different colors that are uh, slightly similar. Uh, it's flickering because I'm clearing the screen and redrawing so often. Uh, but you see how the colors are interpolated between them? Collins? Mm -hmm. So like between a blue corner and a red corner, it goes to purple, then it goes to red, right? Right here in the middle. And then the green corner and the blue corner goes to blue-green, and the green to red has yellow. So it's got almost like a, it's almost like a um, color wheel kind of thing, right? So we've got a red corner, we got a green corner, we got a blue corner. And we need to know, um, we need to know what color 
each point should be. A fill is very simple if they're all the same color, right? You just it's red or whatever, right? So, uh, what if you want to do a colored fill, right? Right? That that's a little trickier, right? And so there's something in math called barycentric coordinates, and I'm I'm going to stop with this. I'm not going to have you guys code this over the weekend. I just want you to do a solid fill over the weekend. Okay. Uh, enter three points and solid fill a triangle to the screen. Okay. Should be able to take your existing code. Draw draw point. It's easy. So uh, let's say that this point here is red. This one here is blue. This one here is green. What color should the point exactly in the center be? What do you think? Yeah, it should be gray, right? What about a point here? What do you think, Collins? Like that point, it's pretty close to red, but it's not exactly red. What uh? What color do you think that one should be? You uh, just had, you just had to guess. Well, mostly red points. Is it is it like in between the blue and the green? Mm -hmm. also? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Color? I'm not sure. Isaac voted for reddish, red with a little bit of purple. Um, yeah, I, I would say it would actually just be, because it's right between green and blue, uh, I would say it's just kind of a little towards gray from the red direction. What about, what about this? No, that's a race. <laughs> what about the color right um, here? Collins, what do you think? Halfway between red and green. Isaac, what do you think? Collins, what do you think? I'm honestly not that good with my colors. <laughs> it's a... Uh... Yeah, uh, red and green make what? Like a darker red, I guess? Nah, it's yellow. Yeah. Oh. Yellow is red, green. And this one over here is going to be purple. This one over here is going to be blue, green. So, uh, numerically, this spot here would be like red equal to zero, blue equal to 128, green equal to 128, something like that. No. All right, so how do you, this is, this is called barycentric coordinates, okay? And so, you, these different spots on a triangle are in this weird coordinate system called barycentric coordinates, where basically you talk about the point on a triangle in terms of like how close it is to the three edges, okay? So like this point here is like pretty close to the red, but it's like pretty far from the blue and it's like pretty far from the green, right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So the way that you can compute what fraction of red this should be versus what fraction of blue versus what fa fraction of green is the area of the red triangle here. Huh? The blue triangle, which is very narrow, I kind of have to draw a line to it. And, oh, that, sorry, that's the green triangle. And the blue triangle, which is a little bit bigger. Do you see that? Do you see how if you have this point here, it forms a it forms three triangles on the inside? Mm -hmm. So if you add up the area of the red triangle and the green triangle and the blue triangle, you get some number. And the fraction of the color here that is red is equal to red divided by n. And the, fra the fraction that is green is equal to the green divided by n. And the fraction that is blue is equal to blue divided by n. So um, if this is pure red, 
and it's very, very close. Like, imagine it's like right here. It's like just a touch away from red. The red triangle is going to have like probably like 99% of the area within here, right? We're talking about the relative fraction of the areas. Do you see how the red triangle is like way bigger than the other ones, right? Because yeah. it's if, if it was here, like the lines would be like this, right? Like it, there'd just be this narrow sliver of a triangle for green and a narrow sliver of triangle for blue. And so the red triangle would have 99% of the area. That's what these fractions are. This means the red triangle has 99% of the area. The green triangle has somewhere around zero. And the blue triangle here has, I don't know, like 1%. Something like that. That makes sense? So, yeah. the, so the color we end up with is going to be 99% red, 0% green, 1% blue. We're done. Okay. Make sense? Yep. And so, like, if it's perfectly in the center, right? If it's perfectly in the center, then the, uh, I call this the red pixel point the red vertex the blue vertex the green vertex do you see how the three rectangles are going to have the equal areas if i drew a straight line <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and so in this case the red triangle the green triangle and the blue triangle all have equal sides and so the amount of red you'd get is equal to one third of red the amount of green you'd get is one third of green the amount of blue you'd get is one third of blue and it works out to like a gray grayish color right mm -hmm. ship does that make sense to you so you just compute the area of the you compute the areas of the of the triangles and then you just figure out what the relative fraction is. So how do you do that? How do you compute the area of a triangle like this? It's not immediately obvious, you know, how to do it. So how do you how would how would you do it, Chip? Like you got you got you got this you got the point you're trying to figure out the color for, you got the three vertices. And you got three triangles on the inside. As a result, you need to figure out the relative fraction of them. Base times height times two. Yeah. Well, okay. So the base would be like you could do like the the high pot, right, from uh, here to here, and that's the base. But then you got some weird trig stuff going on here because this is actually two triangles instead of one, or maybe it's not. But you, like if you want to do a right triangle, like you drop a, a tangent line. Like no, no, no. There's a much easier way. Good news, Collins. Good news much easier way okay check it out check this out all right you ready all right sweet uh uh let me draw a triangle that's bigger make a big triangle and we're trying to figure out this the color of this point here right okay. and this vertex is colored red and this vertex is colored blue, just to stick with my pattern. If they're all red, it's very easy. The answer is red. <laughs> you know, and so we want to figure out the relative ratios of these of these things. Check it out. The answer is again cross product. You know, I told you in 50A that this is actually important to know. It's important to know. So cross product gives you the area. So if you have uh, one vert, uh, vector like that, one vector like that, it will actually give you the area of a parallelogram. So that's that's what the cross product does. The cross product gives you that area. If I can write cross product, that's that's the area. Now you might be saying, well, that's a parallelogram. It's not a triangle. Well, check it out. It's just double. Right? It's just a double triangle, right? And as it turns out, because you're doing a ratio of these things, all of these are going to have twice the answer they're supposed to have. So they all cancel out. Do you understand, Collins? Like, if, if this guy was supposed to have an area of five, let's say, if you take the cross product, the cross product of this and this, if this guy is supposed to have an area of five, if you cross product this vector here from P1 to P2 and to F. <clears throat> if, if this area, if this triangle here has an area of, um, of five, the cross product is going to tell you the area is 10. And then if you take the cross product from uh, P2 to P3 and P2 to F, and that's going to have an area of also five, it'll give you 10. 
and, in, and this guy from P3 to P1 and from P3 to F might have an area of two, so it'll tell you it's four. But here's, here's the thing. Um, here's the thing. Because you're doing a relative ratio, it doesn't matter if you get the right answer or the double answer for all three of them. Right? So like the total area that's wrong that we got here is 24, right? And so the fraction of this guy is 10 24ths, which is 5 twelfths. This guy is also 5 twelfths of the total area. And then this one's going to be 2 twelfths or 1 sixth. And it doesn't matter whether we use 10 or 5. If you do the math, 12, 5 twelfths, 5 twelfths, 2 twelfths, or 1 sixth. They all cancel out. Okay. So it's it's actually it's actually not bad. Uh, if you have a point, and you have a if you have a cross product function that takes in two vectors and gives you the scalar cross product, you just pass that in, pass that in, and it tells you the area. It's wrong. It's off by a factor of two. But you actually don't even need to divide by two. You don't you don't need to because you're just getting fractions. You're getting percentages. And whether or not you get ten ten and four or five five and two doesn't matter. The fractions are the same. Cross product, cross product, cross product three cross products will tell you the relative fraction of um, red, of green, and of blue. Okay. And remember, this is the red triangle, right? Because the closer you are to red, the bigger this triangle is. And the closer you are to green, the bigger this triangle is. So this is the green triangle here, this is the blue triangle here, and this is the red triangle here. Okay. So um, that is going to be your assignment over the Weekend, you have to uh, you have to fill a triangle. Um, if you guys want, I could break it up into two halves: one doing a solid fill, and then maybe on Tuesday have you do the barycentric fill. So you can have like a color gradient fill. Does that that work for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. The assignment I'm going to push out is this one, but just remember in your head. For Monday, just show me a solid red triangle on the screen. Good to go. And uh, I think the I think the directory has the uh, cross product. Uh, no, not you. Uh, product in it. Um, okay, I've not given you a cross product. So let me just give you the let me give you the answer. You can code it up yourself. There's there's two different kinds of cross product by the way. There's what's called scalar cross product. And there's vector cross product. This gives you a number, and this gives you a vector. So if you if you pass in this vector here and this vector here, if you do scalar cross product, it gives you scalar cross product gives you the area. Vector cross product gives you a vector normal to both of these, and the magnitude of this is the same size as the area of this. So it's kind of the same thing, but it's kind of different. Um, because one's a vector and one's an int or a float or whatever it is you're working on. So how do you do scalar cross product? Because uh, we don't really care about this one. So if you have um, uh, let's see x1, y1 and x2, y2 um, and, uh, sorry 0, 0 So you've got point zero zero as one corner, x1, y1 as one point, x2, y2 as another point. The scalar, oh my gosh, I, I, I gotta go after this. Um, so the scalar cross product is gonna be x1, y2, 
minus x2, y1. And that's it. One of the corners is 0, 0. Uh, so you have to normalize it if these points, if that point is not 0, 0, you have to slide them all so that the corner is 0, 0. So you're gonna have to subtract by the x and y location here. Um, but that's that scalar cross product right there. That's the equation. Okay. It's really easy. So if you have a guy here, and you have a guy here, and this guy's at 2, 0, and this guy's at 1, 1, and this guy's at 0, 0, then the, uh, uh, it's going to be 1 times 0 minus 2 times 1, and so you get an answer of negative 2. Okay. So the area of the triangle is negative 1. Like I said, it depends on the order you do things. You'll either get you'll get a negative if you go clockwise, you get a positive if you go counterclockwise. Don't the sign tells you whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. The magnitude is the area. But that's that's it. It's real easy. And if the point is not at zero zero, then you have to kind of um, you have to kind of like uh, slide everything over. And so let me let me give you an example of that. So if you have uh, if this point is ten ten. And this point is 11, 11, and this point is 12, 10. Well, it's the exact same triangle as before, right? So what you do is you subtract off this value from that, from that, so you get a 1 and a 2, you subtract off a 10 off that, and you end up with 1, 1, and 2, 0, and 0, 0. So you just slide, you translate everything over the origin, make life simple. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. I gotta go. So is that dot product? This is cross product. Dot product is very similar, but also very different. So it is, uh, dot, this is cross product. This is scalar cross product. And um, you can go from um, vector cross product to scalar cross product, um, Isaac, by taking the magnitude of it. But it's a lot more effort. Like, this is simple. <laughs> this is really easy. Uh, dot product looks like this. Dot product looks like this, x1, x2, plus y1, y2. That's dot product. So if you have two vectors like this, and this guy is 1, 0, and this guy is 1, 0, 1 times 1 is 1, plus 0 times 0 is 0, equals 1. Yes, they're pointed the same direction. If you have negative 1, it's pointed that way instead. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, plus 0 times 0 is negative 0. Added together, you get negative 1. They're pointed in opposite directions. So dot product is useful for telling you if two things are looking the same way. Um, cross product is useful for telling if something is rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. And it's also use, useful for calculating area like this. And so it computes the area of the, of the uh, parallelogram. Right? But uh, to get the triangle, you just divide by 2. Okay, so that's it. I got a jet. Thanks for coming out, you guys, and uh, work on uh, just a solid fill for Monday, and then we'll do a bare center coordinate fill uh, with shading, or not sh uh, shading between the different colors, interpolating between the colors on Tuesday. And the board games, yeah, bringing the board games on Monday. We should have some fun with that, too. All right, peace All out, right. you guys. All right.